Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining MSAA's live webinar, Living with a Mess as an LGBTQIA person, presented by MS Specialist, Dr. William Conti. This webinar is part of MSAA Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Initiatives. My name is Jahaira Rivera, and I'm a Director of Mission Delivery and Program De Development for MSAA, and I'm your host for the program tonight. Just a little bit of background about MSAA and some housekeeping items before we get started. As you may know, MSAA is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving lives today through vital services and support for the entire MS community. Our services include a national helpline providing English and Spanish services Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, equipment and cooling distribution programs with products designed to improve safety, mobility, and to help with heat sensitivity. In addition, MSAA offers an MRI access program for individuals with MS who qualify for assistance. We also have educational programs, webinars, and on-demand videos, online tools, publications, and digital resources that includes the just released Ultimate Treatment Guide, which is now available on our website. This interactive guide describes and compares 19 FDA approved MS treatments and will help people living with MS make informed decisions and choices. MSAA also offers support through community connection to help you stay connected to members of the MS community. All of our programs are available to people living with MS nationwide. To learn more about MSAA programs and services, please visit our website, mymsaa.org, or give us a phone call. During tonight's program, you will have an opportunity to ask questions by typing them into the chat box. We'll do our best to answer your questions during the Q&A portion of tonight's webinar. At the end of the program, we ask if you could please complete a brief survey. Your feedback is important to us and it helps us in developing future programming and content. A link to the survey is also going to be included in the chat box. As a friendly reminder, this program is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute formal recommendations. If you have specific questions about your diagnosis or treatment, we always recommend that you reach, reach out to your healthcare provider or physician. Now let's talk about our learning tonight. Our learning tonight is going to provide us with a deeper understanding and awareness of the unique needs of the LGBTQIA community living with MS. Dr. Conti, will define common terms, describe health disparities, and discuss topics such as hormone replacement therapy and factors that may influence disease-modifying therapy selection in MS patients who are part of the LGBTQIA community. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our speaker this evening. We are extremely grateful to have Dr. William Conti with us tonight presenting on our topic. Dr. Conti is an MS specialist at the Comprehensive MS Center at Methodist Hospitals in Murrayville, Indiana, and he's also an adjunct assistant professor of neurology at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Dr. Conti earned a bachelor degree in neurobiology from the University of Florida. He graduated from medical school at Loyola University, Chicago Street School of Medicine, and went on to complete an adult neurology residency at Loyola University Medical Center. Additionally, Dr. Conti completed a fellowship in multiple sclerosis and a neuromyology at the University of Chicago through a National MS Society Sylvia Laurie Award and earned a master's degree in public health sciences. Dr. Conti believes in customizing therapy to the individual patient. With a strong interest in clinical trials and research, he has been the principal or co-investigator on multiple clinical trials 
and investigator initiated studies. Dr. Conti frequently lectures on various topics and presents research at national and international conferences. The MS Center at Methodist, which Dr. Conti leads, is recognized as a partner in MS care by the National MS Society. Welcome, Dr. Conti. We are looking forward to your presentation. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me from the MSAA. Really excited to be here tonight. So, um, you know, this is sort of a new topic that, um, you know, we are, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to spearhead uh, continuously talking about um, LGBTQ plus, um, the, the needs of the LGBTQ plus community in MS care. Um, these are my disclosures, which I don't think are really pertinent to tonight's topic. Um, and so, so like was this just discussed, my goal tonight is really to sort of define the terms um, to find the differences between sexual orientation and gender identity in the common LGBTQ plus terms. Um, I also want to describe health disparities that uh, queer people face. Uh, I want to describe how gender affirming hormone therapy affects people with MS and also discuss some disease modifying therapy selection considerations. So, you know, LGBTQ+, plus, LGBT, LGBTQIA, LGBTQIA+, plus, right? There's a lot of letters um, that are in, that, you know, I feel like are evolving as the years go on. Um, and so I just want to go down to the basics and sort of talk about the terms. Um, I don't want to offend anybody that already knows the terms, but I think it's always good just to re-summarize things. So L, lesbian. Um, is really just a female who is sexually and or emotionally attracted to other females. Gay is, a, is, is really the same, but it's, it's a male to male. Um, bisexual is sexual or emotional attraction to both males or females. Um, and sometimes people include attraction to transgender people, depending on the person, um, their, their own personal preferences. Transgender is an umbrella term for those whose gender is different from their sex assigned at birth. We'll be talking a little bit more about this. Um, and, uh, oops, excuse me, uh, queer que Q is queer questioning. So queer is an umbrella term for sexual and gender minorities that are not heterosexual or cisgender. So this is just, you know, we, we think, we, I, I like to use the term queer for like, you know, it's a shorthand for the whole community. Questioning is a term that refers to people who are unsure or questioning um, their gender or sexual orientation. So we're, we're inclusive of, of those people. Um, I is intersex. So um, this is a little bit more interesting. So there's a variation in sex characteristics uh, that include chromosomes, gonads, or genitals that do not allow an individual to be distinctly identified as a male or female. Asexual or ally, which is the A. So asexual is lack of sexual attraction to anyone. An ally is, is really a person who considers himself a friend to the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and then the plus, which is really, I think the most important, um, um, really the term here is that um, it's, it's the others, right? So um, the plus really considers um, that uh, there's an unlimited sexual orientation and gender identities, right? So uh, this is really unlimited type of um, orientations or identities. So what is the prevalence of the queer community, right? So about 4.5% of the US population identifies uh, as LGBT. That's about 11 million people. And there's more females than males in, in that. Um, and the transgender is about 4.5% of the US population, which is actually over a million people. So. I mean, we're going to um, see people like this. Um, so one important thing I wanna talk about is the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation, right? So gender identity is your inner sense of your own gender and may not match your sex assigned at birth versus sexual orientation. It's related to the gender or genders of your romantic and sexual partners. So everybody has a gender identity and sexual orientation orientation, whether you're queer, whether you're straight, everybody has a gender identity and sexual orientation. And transgender is not a sexual orientation, okay? So it's a very important thing to remember. So transgender um, is uh, a person whose gender identity does not correspond to their sex assigned at birth. Um, and cisgender would be a person whose gender identity does correspond to their sex assigned at birth. 
And gender expression is the way a person communicates their gender to those around them, such as appearance or mannerisms, right? So everybody has a gender expression. So what is an example of this? So a transgender man would be in the, the assigned sex at birth would be female and the present gender identity would be a man, okay? So gender affirmation, which, you know, was formerly uh, the term we use was transition, is, is sort of a process where a transgender person is able to outwardly express who they are to others. And there's many different types of gender affirmation, right? So there could be social affirmation, which is like changing name, pronouns, clothes, hair. It's more of like a social situation versus legal affirmation, which is changing name and gender on official documents. And there's medical and surgical affirmation. So medical affirmation would be gender affirming hormone therapy, which is aligning one's body to their gender identity. And surgical affirmation is actually using surgery to change one's anatomy, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on in the talk. One thing I wanna start talking about is the health disparities that queer people face. So overall, um, we face higher rates of overall disability and physical limitations, right? So it's obviously very concerning for, um, you know, someone who has MS, right? Because it's an intersection of two types of, of problems, right? So there's overall poor general health, um, high rates of HIV amongst gay and bisexual men and transgender women. Although HIV is not unique to the queer community, we do face higher rates of it compared to um, heterosexual and cisgender people. There's higher rates of overweight and obesity in lesbian and bisexual women, higher rates of cancer, even in cardiovascular disease and overall higher rates of healthcare utilization. So what are the causes for this? Um, so I have two theories on this. Um, one of the theories is, is ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, which are um, higher amongst LGBTQ plus people. And then also exposure to anti-LGBTQ plus discrimination leads to adverse health outcomes. So this, I'm gonna break these down. Okay, so what's this ACE study that I mentioned? So, like I said, ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and um, Adverse Childhood Experiences could be um, direct experiences like abuse or neglect, or it could be indirect through living environments like parental conflict, substance abuse, or mental illness. Um, so the ACE study was this very large study done through the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente is like a healthcare system out in California. Um, now it's in multiple states. Um, so it was in the uh, mid nineties and enrolled over 17,000 people. And basically they had, they asked their adult patients who were enrolled in the study, they gave them surveys asking about their childhood experiences and then also their current health status and behaviors. So it was first published in 98 and there's been many publications since then. So what are these definitions? So you know, of course, abuse is on the on the survey. So emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, and also household challenges. But I think what's really pertinent to queer people is that um, uh, is emotional neglect um, basically means someone in your family never or rarely helped you feel important or special. Now that's like a bold statement, right? Um, what I'm what I'm proposing is that you have a closeted queer child who might not feel that they're able to be open to their family, friends, society, and therefore they don't feel important or special. Also, you know, they don't, family um, doesn't have a source of strength or support. Again, supporting, you know, a class of the queer person. Obviously there's exceptions to this generalization that I've made, but um, I think it's something that a lot of queer people experience. And also physical neglect, I don't think is as pertinent to my conversation. So what did they find? So childhood trauma overall was very common. Okay, this is amongst the whole subject um, group. So two thirds of the people had a score of at least one. So meaning one childhood adverse childhood experiences and 87% of those had more than one adverse childhood experience. So their conclusions was people usually experience more than one type of trauma. And they found a direct link between childhood trauma and adult onset of chronic disease, as well as mental health problems. And more types of trauma, AKA a higher A score, increase the risk of health, social, and emotional problems. So this has been studied in MS as well. There was one study that I found. So they found that a higher A score 
led to poor health-related quality of life measures and also increased emotional distress in patients with MS at the time of diagnosis and one year follow-up, okay? They also found increased anxiety at the one year follow-up for people who had higher ACE scores. So what is this, how does this relate to queer people? Um, so overall, they found very consistent rates of higher rates of ACE scores for gay and lesbian people. Um, on average had about two um, average childhood experiences. Bisexual people had about three. So actually it was higher with bisexual people. Just as a comparison, I have some other people. So straight people, about 1.6, and I have some racial changes. So white people, 1.5, black people, 1.6, and Hispanics, 1.8. So higher across the board for queer people. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, what they found here is that, um, here's the category. So um, I have some bolds here. So this is the odds ratio. The odds ratio basically means there were three times the odds of someone. So sexual abuse here. So sexual abuse has been demonstrated to be pretty consistent with uh, queer, queer youth having higher rates of sexual abuse. So they found about three times the rate of sexual abuse compared to um, hetero people. So this is LGB, not trans people. This is lesbian, gay, bisexual people compared to heterosexual people. And then emotional abuse, sort of what I was talking about earlier, 43% of lesbian, gay, bisexual youth had emotional abuse in this study. Uh, and this is about trans people. So um, the take home message here is, um, you know, double the, basically double the amount of odds of poor mental health for transgender people. 57% of transgender people have poor mental health compared to 34% of cisgendered, lesbian, gay, and bisexuals. Okay, so that's one theory I have, right? And then the, the second theory is discrimination. So there's been several hundred studies that have shown evidence that LGBTQ plus discrimination leads to adverse health outcomes, okay? Now the discrimination can be interpersonal, such as bullying, okay? And structural discrimination, such as laws of policy. So what's very interesting about this is that it doesn't need to be direct discrimination to um, a queer person, right? It could be just exposure to hearing about discrimination, right? So seeing someone being bullied or hearing about laws or policies uh, being enacted can lead to the health outcome. So it's linked to health harms, even though for those who are not directly exposed. So it causes internalized stigma, low self-esteem, expectations of rejection and fear of discrimination. So this is minority stress theory, which has been applied in several minority groups. Um, and so intersecting, intersecting identities, such as gender, race, or socioeconomic status, says actually it, it magnifies the harms to the person. So if you think of a, let's, I'm gonna use the example, like a trans woman, black, poor person, right? I mean, that's just multiple identities that's going to escalate the harms, okay? Um, and then protective factors, right? So good support. So we have peer community and family support, access to affirming healthcare and social service and inclusive practices. So people have been trying to study how to protect um, people with minority stress theory. This is all minority groups. And I think, um, you know, these are inroads that we can make. Okay, so, um, so how does this relate, to how, do, how does this relate to MS patients, right? So one thing that I found in this study, so this was in Italy, I believe, was that queer patients were more likely to change MS centers, okay? This is the odds ratio was two, so it means double the amount of patients who were queer um, versus straight people were more likely to change MS centers, okay? And this is in Italy. Um, queer people had more MS patients, had, had lower involvement in, in LGBTQ plus activities due to their MS status. So my takeaway from this study was that uh, people with the MS disease who were part of the LGBTQ plus community, they, they isolated themselves from activities in the LGBTQ plus community. So that's, that's an important thing because you know, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you need peer support to help overcome these obstacles. Now, NARCOMS, if you don't know what that is, NARCOMS is a registry here in the US. It's run by the CMSC in Cleveland Clinic um, that looks, it's, it's a registry where MS patients, you know, contribute to. 
Um, so in their registry, they it's, it's really a database. Um, about about 0.5 percent of, of patients who had MS were were, were transgendered, and 4.6 percent were overall non-heterosexual. Okay, and they found actually similar healthcare utilization between queer people and, heter and heterosexual people. Uh, trans people had less comfort discussing sexual health, which I think makes sense across all healthcare fields. Uh, and bisexual people have the lowest satisfaction with care. So I think this information is very important to help study these things in order to help create a uh, more inclusive environment in the healthcare field for patients, okay? And that's really our responsibility of health, as healthcare professionals. Okay, so I know that was really heavy stuff that I just talked about. So I want to sort of pivot to something a little bit more positive. So I'm gonna talk about gender affirming hormone therapy in people with MS, okay? So what is gender affirming hormone therapy? It's formerly called hormone replacement therapy, okay? So this is actually a gender affirming intervention, right? So it's considered medically necessary for people. And, and across the board, we see a survival benefit for trans people getting gender affirming hormone therapy. So it, it, it's actually a life-threatening problem not withholding gender affirming hormone therapy. It's a recommended criteria for some, but not all surgical treatment, right? So some people argue that um, it should be highly individualized based on the patient's goals. So some patients want to get surgery, other ones want to do gender affirming hormone therapy. Some people want to do both. Some people want to do certain aspects of either one. It's really highly customized to the patient. So what's the criteria for gender affirming hormone therapy? You need a persistent, well-documented gender dysphoria. So that basically means you want, you, you need to feel sort of out of place in your body it, it, with, your, with, you know, the, the, this versus your sex assigned at birth. Um, that you need to make a fully informed decision and to consent for treatment. Uh, you need to be age of majority in a given country, uh, which with additional criteria for younger patients. And if significant medical or mental health concerns are present, they must be reasonably well controlled. Obviously, someone is going to have mental health concerns due to gender dysphoria. Okay, so I'm first gonna talk about feminizing gender affirming hormone therapy. So this is really development of female secondary sex characteristics. So we use estrogens pretty much across the board for this. You know, they used to use progestions um, previously, but that's a little controversial due to um, you know, risk benefits. Um, and it also causes suppression of male secondary sex characteristics. Um, so we give anti-androgens, which is, you know, spironolactone and finasteride. Um, so these are some technical terms that I'm introducing, but basically these are medications that suppress um, male secondary sex characteristics. And I mean by that, I mean like, you know, genitalia. Also like it, it, it suppresses like, um, you know, male, um, certain hair characteristics on the face, for example, um, things like that. And then, so estrogens in MS. I want to talk about overall estrogen use in MS patients. So um, overall, we found worsening of disability during menopause in women with MS, okay? Estrogen replacement after surgical menopause, like a hysterectomy, has shown beneficial effects on memory. Um, and this was with... Um, premenopausal women, I believe. Um, higher physical physical quality of life measures and postmenopausal women um, on hormone therapy. Um, and then um, there's also a neuroprotective effects of estrogen in mice. So in the um, EAE model of MS, which is basically in, in the animal model of MS in mice, um, they found that estrogen receptors are actually on immune as cells. So when you give estrogen, there's a protective effect versus too low estrogen. There have been some clinical trials in MS with estrogen. So there's a phase two trial several years ago looking at estrogen uh, plus uh, copaxone versus a placebo group. It met its primary endpoint of reducing relapse rates. So that's very promising. And there's an ongoing phase three trial, which is the final phase before drug development, comparing estrogen versus, or plus one of the, one of the disease modifying therapies listed below versus placebo with the primary endpoint of looking at cognition or memory problems, okay? And you look at several different disease modifying therapies added on to estrogen. Okay, so this is ongoing. 
All right, so I'm gonna shift to masculizing uh, gender affirming hormone therapy. So this is for um, using testosterone, right? So testosterone supplementation is used for this. So this creates development of male secondary sex characteristics and suppressing female secondary sex characteristics. So testosterone in, in MS is really like a tale as old as time, right? So they, there's been many studies looking at the neuroprotective effects in MS, right? So testosterone does cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, you know, there's spinal cord neurons. Um, it protects them from stress, increases certain factors in the brain to help protect the body. Um, and then also it decreases something called microglia, in the animal model of MS. So microglia is one of the immune cells in the brain. So it lowers that activation. There's also been evidence that shows that low testosterone levels may be a risk factor for MS in males, in biologic males. And um, it's, it's been shown across all types of age groups. So prenatal, so this is in utero, um, they found lower ratio of testosterone in men with MS compared to controls. Um, in puberty, um, obesity in males increase the risk of MS. So that because of that, there's a higher, so obesity causes a higher conversion of testosterone to estrogen. So there's less testosterone in um, obese males, for example. Um, and then in adults, there's lower levels of testosterone, lower levels of testosterone in males with MS compared to controls in multiple trials. Okay, my computer is freezing. Okay, so there have been some trials on testosterone with MS. Sorry, my computer is just like, there we go. So there was a pilot study looking at improvement in cognition and slowing of brain atrophy with testosterone supplementation. Um, low testosterone levels um, is associated with increased EDSS scores, which is the disability score and worsening cognitive decline. And there's an ongoing phase two trial of testosterone supplementation on remyelination. Very interesting, right? In neuroprotection and MS, looking at MRI parameters as the primary outcome. Okay. Um, so I want to end on talking about um, disease modifying therapy in HIV positive patients. So like I said earlier, HIV positivity is not unique to the um, LGBTQ plus population, but it does impact um, this community more than um, other communities. Um, so there's a couple of drugs that, um, you know, actually in the label, you're not supposed to use with HIV positive patients. So that's Mavenclad, um, which is oral cladribine. It's actually contraindicated for use with patients who are HIV positive. So you're supposed to screen for them. And there's also a warning about simultaneous use with antiviral and antiretroviral drugs. So you know, one thing I want to mention about these things um, is that what happens in clinical trial development is that, um, you know, patients aren't totally in, in a vacuum, right? So, you know, they, they want to exclude patients who are HIV positive because, you know, HIV positivity or having HIV can affect something called the lymphocytes, right? So you guys are all aware of what lymphocytes are, I think. You know, you hear about that probably from your doctor. You know, let's check your lymphocyte count. So HIV can lower the lymphocytes, right? But I think there's, you know, there's different types of HIV patients, really two types in my view. There's a patient who was just diagnosed with HIV. They didn't know they had HIV and they have a low, something called a low CD4 count, which is one of the lymphocytes, um, high virus in the body, and they're really sick, right? But then there's a patient who may have had HIV for a very long time, and you know they're on medicine, um, really you can't detect any HIV in their blood, um, they have a normal lymphocyte or CD4 count, and what happens is in the MS clinical trials is that they exclude them all just being HIV positive without any sort of recognition of the different phenotypes or types of HIV. And I think we're doing a disservice to patients because then the FDA looks at the clinical trials and says, well, you didn't study HIV positive patients, so we must put in the label to the doctors that they're contraindicated, right? So it, it, it's sort of a controversy, I think, that um, 
you know, we're excluding patients from clinical trials. And there's this big movement to increase diversity in, in MS clinical trials, especially racial diversity. But I think we're missing the boat with, um, you know, with sexual and gender minorities uh, who want to contribute to these clinical trials, but they're being, a lot of people are being excluded because of HIV status. So like I said, you know, oral clastrophene is contraindicated for use with HIV positive, same thing with Lumtrada. Now Lumtrada is interesting because it actually causes a reduction in the CD4 count. So I actually agree that you probably shouldn't um, have HIV with Lumtrada. Now Ocrevus and Kisimta are interesting because the label actually says contraindicated for use in patients with an active infection, right? So, you know, this is more of a legal question, I think, you know, what, what constitutes a, an active infection? Now, I argue that, you know, a stable HIV positive patient probably is not, that's more of an active, not really an active infection, but chronic infection. So it gets a little bit complicated, just like I said, because of these clinical trials, they weren't studied. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, this is not a historical issue, right? So this, it's 2022 right now. All the phase three trials for MS patients for the newer drugs are still con are still excluding HIV positive trials. So I, I've, I've called on the pharmaceutical companies to help increase diversity in clinical trials, but, you know, I, I challenge them to, um, to keep that effort going. Okay, so that's basically it. So hopefully I have taught you guys something. So I think it's important to understand the LGBTQIA plus terminology. Um, you know, queer people are also at higher risk for certain health conditions due to health disparities. Hopefully I've made that point across. Uh, gender affirming hormone therapy is, I think it is safe for use in people with MS. Um, and um, certain disease modifying therapies must be used in caution with people who are HIV positive but the clinical trials must aim to improve inclusivity for these patients. Do you want to touch on a few resources before we open it up to the question and answer session? So um, a, lot of, a lot of, so the Fenway Institute, so Fenway is a um, healthcare system for queer people in Boston. It's very famous, and but they have a very good health education website, really an institute. This is mostly for, I think, healthcare professionals, but it's very good information if any, any healthcare professionals are listening to this. The Williams Institute, I use some of the statistics from, and they, they keep their website very up to date. The Gay and Lesbian Medical Association is, it, it advocates for medical equity um, and treatment for queer people. There is, a, there is one that I've found, National MS Society, um, LGBTQ plus support group. I, I, I shortened the link here. So if you guys want to copy down tinyurl.com slash these digits, it's much longer. It's nationalmssociety.org slash so, 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 so. But if you just go to this website, it should forward you. I created a forward link. Um, it's virtual. I think it's based in New York. Um, the Trevor Project, if there's any young queer people, it's a 24 hour support. Um, phone service, sort of like the National Suicide and Crisis Line, which is now 988. But the Trevor Project is really dedicated to the young queer people who are in crisis. PFLAG is an advocacy group. It gets better is for, is for youth. NAMI is the National North American Mental something. Um, it's more for mental health, but there's, there's, there's lots of queer resources there. And then here's a website for LGBTQ plus caregivers, okay? So I think that's basically it for me. I'm gonna, we should probably open it up to um, question and answers now, but. Thank you, Dr. Conti, for such a wonderful presentation and um, providing facts and information to empower the audience. We do have some questions that we'll like to go over with you. We received questions during the registration process as well as during tonight's presentation. So talking about stigma and health disparities, we received um, several questions along those lines. What advice could you offer for LGBTQ plus MS patients who feel nervous or anxious when talking about these topics with their healthcare provider? So I have a controversial opinion on this. I think you should challenge your healthcare professional on this. And I think you should, well, okay, so first of all, I think you, you need to be open with your healthcare professional. Obviously that's easier said than done. 
but we need to know from you what are your challenges, your fears, and your lifestyles, right? But you know, if you're nervous about talking about your healthcare professional about this, I think there's two types of nervousness here. One, there's fear of being rejected, right? That your healthcare professional doesn't really um, isn't really open to queer people, and I think you should challenge that healthcare professional. And if you don't get a good um, feedback from them, you should be out of there. Okay, right. So then you know you shouldn't be with a healthcare professional. The second sort of um, issue is: Are they competent in you know sort of LGBTQ plus healthcare? Right. That's a little bit more challenging. I think what would be a good sign, so I still think you should be open with them about it, and a good sign would be their willingness to learn from you or from other resources. So I think you should just be open. You know, I'm, I'm very, you know, as a patient, I'm very, I'm very quick to say, you know, look, I'm gay. Um, and even to patients, I'm like, you know, I meant, I, I, I'm pretty open about it to my patients just sort of to create a welcoming environment, but that's just me. Definitely, that's great advice. And um, knowing that MS is a, it's a chronic disease and requires care. It's important to have that trust and open communication with um, the physician and or healthcare provider. Thank you, Dr. Conti. Another question that we um, received during registration is how common is multiple sclerosis within the queer community? Yeah, so we just don't know. I mean, I, um, you know, there's very few studies. I did mention. Um, in one of my slides about the NARCOMS registry, and I, 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 I probably should look, but I think it was 4.6% is what I said, identified as non-heterosexual in the NARCOMS registry. And I think it was about half a percent that were identified as trans. So, so I mean, at lower rates, uh, obviously, I mean, the problem with, with learning about the rates of um, MS in this community is one, I think it's, there's a bias of, you know, patients disclosing their, their, you know, their sexual or gender, their sexual orientation or gender identity to these surveyors, right? So there's obviously lower rates than that are, are reported than actually there are. And also some people, um, you know, for example, a man who has sex with men, they may not identify as part of the queer community, but yet, you know, they're, they're, uh, participating in sort of different behaviors. Okay, thank you. And talking about hormone replacement therapy, we did receive um, several questions uh, um, about um, this topic. What is the relationship between hormone replacement therapy and MS symptoms? So, yes. So, um, you know, sort of what we see is, is that there's, they're, 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 I mean, so first of all, these are still being studied, right, ongoing, and it's obviously a very complex subject matter, you know, especially with like estrogens, for example, if you think about even just in, 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 in heterosexual people, in, in, in cisgender people, um, hormone replacement therapy really depends on are they perimenopausal, postmenopausal, premenopausal, right, so it, it depends on that, and then testosterone, you know, I sort of mentioned, helps improve some of the sym symptomatology, um, depending if there's low testosterone levels, right? So, you know, with estrogens, um, we, we, there have been studies showing that it increases sort of memory and cognition um, in certain patients, right? The question is what patients would you give that to? Okay, thank you. How about um, the TGD hormone? Could that increase the risk of MS? So, you know, this is an interesting question. So um, there ha there's been one study that has shown that a, um, you know, testosterone, well, giving estrogens and, and lowering testosterone and giving anti-androgens for someone who's, you know, the sex assigned birth is a man who's now transitioning to a female um, ha may increase the risk of MS. Um, so there's been one study looking at this. So in that study, the theory is that low testosterone being suppressed um, may, may increase the risk of MS. Now in that study, there were four cases of MS in trans women um, and the expected rate was 0.6, I believe. 
So it's it's the small number of cases, but there was a discrepancy. So the more information needs to be researched. Definitely. Okay, thank you, Dr. Conti. And talking about challenges and risks, uh, we received questions of, of transgender MS patients that um, they're asking about, are there any challenges when choosing a treatment or when um, going under the hormone replacement therapies, any risks or challenges that they need to be aware? So I propose that, um, you know, first of all, you need to be with a knowledgeable healthcare professional who is aware of, you know, sort of how to do hormone replacement therapy. I argue that based on the data, it's probably safe for MS patients to go to undergo hormone replacement therapy. Um, the issue is, is there's been no studies on this. So, um, you know, as more and more people are open and wanting to become their authentic self, you know, I think more information will come about, right? But I, I propose based on, you know, using the data from, you know, let's say, you know, estrogen replacement for postmenopausal women or perimenopausal women and testosterone replacement, um, I think it is safe. Definitely. So there is a need of more research so that we can have more information about these topics, but this is, this is a good start. And thank you so much for answering these questions. Um, what about someone who is detransitioning? Would that affect the MS treatment? Probably not. Um, I think, um, you know, again, it's, it's, you still need to treat the MS, right? So like, I argue, look, if you're either transitioning or detransitioning, just treat the MS. I don't think it need, you need to um, modify what you're doing with the MS, right? You need to be treating the MS effectively. You need to be you know, using high efficacy therapy and really suppressing the MS disease state down. I say with that, I mean, I, mean, I just don't know if there is a risk or not about detransitioning, but um, I, I don't think there is. Okay. Thank so you're being treated for MS. So definitely it's important to have that open communication with the healthcare provider and choosing the right treatment, following the treatment for MS, and then of course, um, what works for them. And we also have a question about pregnancy. If it's an MS transgender um, patient who comes on and off the treatment because of the pregnancy, are there any risks or um, things to consider? So I would treat this as any kind of pregnant patient. Um, you know, if you get 10 MS specialists in a room and ask what you do with pregnancy with MS, you're gonna get 10 different answers. So, I mean, like it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's high, I think it's highly personalized what to do for a pregnant MS patient and the treatment options um, or, the, or lack thereof. Um, it just depends. I would again. I would. I would treat this as if it's it's, it's a cisgendered person um, who who just happens to be pregnant. Thank you. So now we know that you provided information um, about HIV and MS, and we do have a couple of questions regarding that topic. Is there a direct correlation between MS and HIV? So what's been shown, there's been some theories with HIV actually, um, well, HIV treatment, um, helping MS, okay? Um, that um, antiretroviral treatment might actually lower the risk of relapses, right? But it hasn't really, you know, been fully researched, uh, but there are some theories and it's very scientific and complicated, a little bit over my head, about um, you know reverse transcriptase and things like that you know affecting um, the the relapse rate of MS right so obviously there's more to MS than the relapse rate you know there's disability progression there's MRI activity brain atrophy and and you know these these this isn't a clinical trial controlled clinical trial that has been undertaken on this topic um, but yeah there's has been some people that have theorized that there's a lower rate with with HIV treatment I'm not so sure about HIV itself. Um, you know, the issue is, is, you know, HIV is in, sort of in the immunosuppressed state to have an active HIV with, like I said, like I said, there's been, you know, there's, there's two types of HIV patients. Like I said, there's a newly diagnosed who is immunosuppressed and there's one who has chronic HIV who's well-treated. I think those are two different types of patients. 
Okay, thank you for, for that. And um, another question is about advocacy. Could advocacy be useful with the FDA in terms of increasing inclusion for the LGBTQ community in clinical trials? So I would argue this is actually a pharmaceutical company issue because um, not to blame them, but you know, the FDA, you know, they are the ones who do the review once the results are done, but they are involved in the process when they're when the clinical trials are being run. But ultimately it's up to the sponsor of the clinical trial to set the parameters of the trial within the reason, right? So if there's outliers, the FDA is obviously going to look at that and be like, well, this isn't so kosher. Um, you know, I think, I mean, sure, it could be a two-pronged approach, you know, adv advocating with the FDA to help increase this. But I think ultimately, I, I, and, and I've done this, I've challenged the, the sponsors of these trials to say, well, look, you know, include these patients um, who, um, you know, you know. So, so lately there's been this push for racial diversity in clinical trials, but you no, know, it doesn't end with racial diversity. It, 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 it's, there's more to diversity than just racial diversity, although it's very important, I think. And so I think, um, you know, it's, it's just, it, it, there's cultural factors involved. And I think we need to sort of start reporting these things in the clinical trials to see if there's a difference between the different groups, right? So right now, the, you know, you know, gender minorities and sexual minorities are not even reported as as a baseline characteristic in the clinical trials. Um, so it's just, you know, I mean, there, there's there's people like that in there. It's just we just don't know. Definitely, and to segue to that that you're just mentioning about representation, inclusivity, where could the community uh, found? find about research information or opportunities in clinical trials? How can they find um, opportunities um, other than through their healthcare provider? Are there any websites or um, organizations that they can go and find those opportunities? Yeah, so um, if you really want to get fancy, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, now, it's not the most user-friendly. I just sort of finally have learned to navigate it. But honestly, all FDA sort of run clinical trials throughout the world are on this website, right? You, you, you go to the website, clinicaltrials.gov. On the right-hand side, there's like four boxes and you can select, you know, active, not recruiting, inactive. And then you type in multiple sclerosis for the condition. Okay. And then there's uh, other stuff that you can sort of type in. And, and I'll show you all the clinical trials now. The problem is it's sort of information overload, I think, on that website, right? So, you know, it gets a little complicated. So, but I mean, honestly, and what's nice about that website is once you click on a clinical trial, you can see who's running it. Like, so, mm -hmm. you know, like my clinical trials are on the website and you can see my location there. So, you know, you can, you can, you can actually filter it by your location and see what's in sort of a geographic area for you. Um, so that's probably the best resource other than Googling, which, you know, is a little risky, um, the Google, um, mm -hmm. you know, talking to a healthcare professional might not be the best route, depending on where you're at, mm -hmm. because it just, you know, just might not know. And then, you know, you're kind of left with not knowing, um, you know, also these companies, um, they have some savviness, you know, some, you know, they, they if there's a site in your area, you, it should be popping up in your Facebook, Instagram sometimes as a targeted ad. So I've seen that lately sometimes, but I always go to clinicaltrials.gov. I think it's probably the best resources, even though it's not it's not that user-friendly, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, it's, it's an important topic because like mentioned, we mentioned before, there's the need uh, for more information uh, for the LGBTQIA plus community that is living with MS and if they're aware um, of, of those opportunities, then um, more information and more uh, data to, to make decisions and to inform the community. Thank you. Um, and what about mental health? Talking about mental health and minority identity is linked to stress. And we know that um, sometimes because of the systemic barriers or the stigma or discrimination, um, just having a diagnosis of MS alone could cause anxiety, depression, and if uh, one belong to a minority community, that will add up to, um, to that. So mm -hmm. what strategies could this community use to cope with this chronic disease 
and also with stigma? So I think it's been studied across all disease states, all minority groups, that a social network is really important. The problem is, is, is in my presentation, I mentioned this, was that you know queer people who have MS in this one study were less likely to seek out queer advocacy groups. And so it's a, it's a catch 22, right? So, you know, you need sort of a village to help you be feel supported, but there's stigma with having a disease in certain communities. And so it gets obviously very complicated. And I think, you know, you, you'll really see who your true friends are, I think with, with certain diseases like MS and, you know, I, I would, I would, my advice is you want to be social, you know, you want to, be, you want to make sure your, your, um, you know, your health is in check, you know, you want to have a good diet and exercise, and it's really a comprehensive package, I think. Definitely, thank you for that advice, having a, a healthy lifestyle, and having definitely a support group, um, and, and finding that in friends and family and talking about support groups, because we know that it's important um, when you're facing and navigating the MS journey. Um, are there any MS support groups specific to the LGBTQIA plus community? Well, there was that one, there's that one in New York. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know how to get it to you guys, but I mean, if you Google, if you go to National MS Society and you Google it, um, you'll find it, but I put it in my presentation. Maybe we can send it out afterwards. I, I made a tiny URL link um, in order to direct you to, but that's the only one I'm aware of, which is, I actually think it's a little problematic. You know what I mean? Like, so if anybody wants to start another one, I'm, I'm happy to sponsor it and uh, help out with it. But um, I think it's important because like I said, that one study looked at stigma of having MS in the queer community. And I think having an MS support group for queer people would be really powerful. Definitely. And um, Dr. Conti, we also have a question um, about DMTs. Um, what is the best way to go about understanding side effects of a disease modifying therapy? Well, I mean, like, look, any drug is gonna have a side effect, right? Aspirin's gonna have a side effect. Tylenol has side effects, right? So, you know, I don't think the, um, in general, what I tell patients is that um, like we want to take the side effects seriously, but we don't, we also, you need to think about the side effects of not treating your MS properly first and foremost, right? So I always talk about this like benefit risk ratio. So like you want a big number, right? So how do you get a big number if you're looking at a ratio? You have this put benefits in the numerator risks in the denominator, right? So above and below, right? So obviously a low risk drug is gonna give you, you know, a big number, but that doesn't exist, right? So if a relative relative risk, but then you have what you want high benefit of the drug and that gets you a big number, which you don't want is low benefit and high risk. But I always encourage patients to think about this concept of, if you don't treat your MS properly, you're gonna get way more sort of side effects than the drug can possibly give you. Okay. And um, Dr. Conti, we also have a question about, um, um, and I quote, do you think the LGBTQ plus community makes itself inaccessible for MS patients? Um, like for example, um, at pride events, um, how can they advocate for themselves to, to consider the MS um, community within the LGBTQ community? And yeah, it's really tough. Like I've said, like, you know, I've said a couple of times now, you know, there's that one study that looked at this, but I think there's this, you know, being part of this community, I think um, is, you know, myself, is there is a stigma on, you know, sort of being diseased. And I think that's from, you know, HIV and AIDS, right? And, um, you know, unfortunately, the trauma from it. And um, it's, 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 you know, I think, especially amongst gay men, I don't know if I can speak for, you know, the other ones for um, um, in, in the queer community, but you know, there is this persona of health and, and beauty. And I think, you know, we, we've sort of, you know, hit ourselves in the, in the ankle a little bit or the Achilles with, um, with that. And that, um, you know, it's a societal thing, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I can't fix the world. And I think, um, what we need to do is you need to find that community 
And like I said earlier, I think that um, um, you'll quickly find out who your true friends are, right? And so, you know, you know, this question question asked about like pride events, and you know, I think it depends on the city. Again, like here in Chicago, I think they do a pretty good job of creating an inclusive sort of family friendly, um, you know, handicap accessible pride par parade experience. I don't know about the actual yeah. festival is true about that, but um, it's tough. It's really tough, I think. I mean, and this is just not unique. This is not unique to the queer community. This is, you know, if you look at, you know, certain cities, you know, not the most handicap accessible, for example, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's tough, I think, but it's so important to have that social support, I think. And, and um, like you said, you'll quickly find out who your true friends are, for better or for worse. That's right. So um, knowing the information is important, staying informed, uh, participating of webinars like this one, uh, having an open communication with the healthcare provider, with family members, finding a support system, and uh, finding information about clinical trials, all of that is going to help um, the MS community to, um, to make decisions um, and to have better outcomes. Dr. Conti, it looks like we have answered the questions and our time together is coming to an end. Um, if you have additional questions, please reach out to our helpline or email the questions to us and we'll try to share those with Dr. Conti. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience? Any advice or takeaways before we bring closure? Yeah, I'm just looking at some of the chat. So it looks like there might be a support group in Oakland. I'm okay. assuming that's queer and MS patients. So I wasn't aware of that. So that's that's great. But again, I mean, now I know two in the country. <laughs> I mean, we need more. <laughs> and then another question about is it advisable or effective to start prep after a disease modifying medicine that suppresses the immune system? I would say yes. Um, you know, I, I don't I think you can do any anti-rich. Well, the first of all, it depends what drug you're on. You know, if you're on cladribine, for example, you're not really supposed to take antivirals with it. Um, but yeah, I say go for it. I mean, because you don't want to, um, it's like, like anything. I mean, you don't want to, infections can worsen MS. Um, so I, I, I think PrEP is okay with MS treatments for most MS treatments. Um, I think that's, we covered everything. I think so. Let me see. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that we went over all of the questions specific to tonight's topic. Um, on behalf of MSAA, thank you, Dr. Conti, for your time, for providing our audience with insightful and important information, for being part of this conversation alongside with MSAA. Um, to our wonderful audience, thank you for being engaged. Thank you for supporting this program. We hope that the information uh, brought some clarity to your questions, and um, we appreciate your support. This concludes our webcast. Tonight's webinar was recorded and will be made available on our website um, in the upcoming weeks. Please visit our website to learn more about MSAA resources and services, and also to look at our calendar for upcoming events. And please take a couple of minutes to fill out the survey. Let us know how we did tonight and give us feedback for upcoming events and programming. Know that MSAA is always thinking about the entire MS community, and we hope that you and your families continue to stay safe. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dr. Conti. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.